my name is Nimare Belu, and I am the NAMI Delaware Diversity and Equity Fellow. It's March, which means it's Women's History Month, and I'm so excited that this month I was given the opportunity to speak with several senators in our state of Delaware. A study recently showed that one in five women report dealing with a mental illness such as depression or anxiety. And even those that do not deal with mental illness, we all, just like we have physical health, we all have mental health that we have to care for. So I'm so happy that the senators took the time to speak with me today and share with me some of their tips for how they take care of their mental health. Thank you so much for joining me, Senator Sturgeon, Senator Pickney, Senator McBride, Senator Henson, Senator Poor, and Senator Lachman. To start off, women always seem to be expected to do it all and have it all, but sometimes that can feel overwhelming. Do you feel that pressure? And if so, how do you deal with it? Oh, absolutely. I think internally we feel that pressure and then externally society applies that pressure to us, right? Are we good enough? Are we strong enough? Can we get the job done? And so, um, for me personally, I'm always striving to make sure I reach that next level. And it, it's really more of an internal clock for me. Um, I feel like in in this life, there's still so much more I have to do and I need to do. And so, um, but yeah, I, I do. I think that as a woman, um, or as my husband reminds me often, there's no senator in this house, Nicole, we still have laundry to do. We still have a kid to pick up or, you know, there's always something happening. And so uh, we have to remind ourselves that we're just everyday people. Um, just that, you know, there, I have a little more added um, stressors maybe than the next person. Mm. Um, thank you so much for having me. And that's an Excellent question. Yes, <laughs> I absolutely feel that pressure. I think, um, you know, I think most women feel it in one way or another. And I think, you know, it comes from, you know, if you've uh, chosen to start a family, you know, have a partner um, and, you know, whatever kind of work that you've chosen to engage in, um, there's just so much pressure not just to do it all, but to do it all like flawlessly or else you're going to, you know, just face a lot of, uh, you know, criticism and derision. And that can be really, really difficult to do. I think for me in terms of how to deal with it, I think, um, you know, just trying to make sure that I'm, I'm keeping my priorities straight and knowing what I value the most in terms of where I put my energy and spend my time and try to be mindful of how um, these other types of things that end up on our plate that we want to be great at, um, of course, but how they can chip away um, and just kind of check myself periodically to remember, um, you know, to check in on myself and make sure that that I'm okay, but also to, to check in on like my family, for example, um, you know, my, my daughter, I would say in particular, and I have another little one on the way, um, and make sure that, that I'm, I'm not allowing things to drain my focus on them. Um, you know, because they're the ones who rely on me the most and need me most to be sort of centered and, and, uh, and healthy. So I would say that's, that's how I deal with it. I just try to catch my breath, step back, um, you know, make sure that I'm okay for the people who rely on me the most. Yes, I do. I think that some of it has to do with my personality of being a bit of a perfectionist. Uh, some of it has to do with being an oldest child um, with, you know, a lot of pressure to, to, I don't know, make sure the, the family is proud and, and, you know, oldest children often um, take on a lot of responsibility and a lot of burden on their shoulders. Um, the fact that I'm a woman, um, I, I, I think does play into it. Although in my particular case, I, I have never had children. So I have never had to face the burden of, well, uh, maybe burden is too strong a word, but I've never had to face the situation of having to balance children of my own with my work, um, which allowed me to really focus on my career. So when I was a teacher for 25 years, I could just I could stay at work super late and not have to worry about rushing home to my own children. Um, I could avail myself of all kinds of like opportunities to go and do professional development out of town, you know, at uh, different campuses. There was a Yale program. There was a Harvard program. There were just things I could do that I think 
women who have children would have a harder time finding ways to balance all that. Um, but I was just always super career driven and loved my work and was lucky that um, I could really focus on that exclusively. So I think in a way, not having children has made it a little easier for me. Um, on the other hand, it's still a lot of pressure. It's I put a lot of pressure on myself. I want to excel at everything I do. And, you know, I have to remind myself it's okay to just be okay at something. It's okay to be mediocre. You don't have to be excellent at every single thing you do. Um, and that's a pressure that I put on myself that's um, actually also has to do with being a daughter of immigrants. There have been a lot of studies that have shown that um, children who are first generation Americans put a lot of pressure on themselves because their families, you know, they really want to fit in and they want their children to shine and they don't want to be looked down on from because they're from another culture or speak another language. So there's also the pressures that came from being a first generation American daughter of immigrants. Uh, my parents definitely felt very strongly that their kids needed to be shining examples of, 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 students, of, of workers, um, because there's a, a lot of pressure when you're an immigrant, especially a Spanish speaking immigrant, that, you know, you don't want to be looked down on and you expect your kids to sort of carry the mantle to show that, you know, we're just as good as anyone else. And, and so there's that pressure too. So I definitely have faced some pressures and I, and I definitely sometimes suffer from a, a from feeling overwhelmed and stressed because I want to, I want to shine and I want everyone to be proud of me. I, I do think that there is a absolutely a pressure to um, not only do everything, have everything, but also do everything well. Um, and and it is absolutely true that when you try to do everything well, uh, it's hard to do anything um, remotely well. And so, you know, I definitely feel that pressure. I, I, I certainly also, as someone who's I think one of the things that people don't really understand uh, about being in elected office, sorry, my uh, internet, my email just, well. I think one thing that people don't totally understand about being in elected office is that fundamentally it's just regular people in a job. And when there is so much attention and coverage of the day-to-day -day of your job, um, it's an interesting dynamic to navigate. And as someone who really has always struggled with anxiety my entire life. Uh, it's absolutely uh, a, a, a challenge to balance the realities of this job with one's own mental health. Um, but you've got you, you've to find the ways to, to keep yourself healthy, whether that's therapy, whether that's, you know, finding time and doing self-care, whatever that is for you, you know, folks who are in politics and government, folks in any kind of leadership position, of course, have to realize that it's okay that they're human. It's okay that they have various needs. It's okay that they might struggle with their mental health uh, and that they can take care of, of that. And that doesn't mean that they're not doing a good job. It doesn't mean that they're not up to the challenge. It doesn't mean that they can't fulfill the role. Yeah, absolutely. I do. Um, particularly, I think, because I, I'm 31, um, right? I'm, I'm not married. I don't have children. Um, I have a great, you know, career work life that's incredibly exciting but then there's always that kind of question of like well you know how society kind of puts on us that by a certain age we're supposed to be married with children and have a career and spend time with our friends and answer all of our text messages and keep our houses clean and get eight hours of sleep and exercise and it's just like i'm not really sure how people make their 24 hours work Mm -hmm. But I try to I try to use mine as best I can and still don't seem to do all of the things that I'm supposed to have done at 31. Um, so I think when it comes to how I balance it, I just give myself grace. Um, there's no such thing as um, doing it all, all the time. Um, and I think that's when we impact our mental health by trying to do those things. So I give myself grace and I celebrate where I am. Um, I enjoy where I am. I steal time for me, whether it's time spent reading, whether it's time spent at the gym or doing Kung Fu, um, or just doing things that I love, like going to the movies by myself. I, I enjoy the space that I'm in and remember that at some point I was praying to be where I am now and hoping to be where I am now. And so I celebrate where I am and look forward to where I'll be at some point. Um, well, yeah, I think you, I think you always feel that. 
but the way to that that I have found to deal with it is is to really um, try to do your best to have the work life balance, knowing that some things you're just going to have to let go, it, and it really depends on where you are in your life. So, I mean, for instance. You know, a good example that I've had to recently face is that I was a practicing environmental attorney at the same time being an elected senator. And it was it was a you know, it's hard to do two demanding jobs at the same time. So it really came to having to make a decision on I need to let something go for my own mental health, because otherwise you know, it, it's a source of anxiety. It's a, it can be a source of all sorts of health problems that flow from that. So the ability to make big decisions to make life a little easier on you, recognizing that that's how you're going to be able to do your best. So I'm now retired from the practice of law and I do this full time. And that makes it made a huge difference in my mental health and the ability to balance, may have more of a work life balance. And how do you create that balance between your work, especially when you work a very taxing job, um, and your home life or your self-care? Um, I make sure that I spend um, time with my grandkids and my kids, particularly on the weekend, as best as possible. There will be some weeknights, like I'm usually out three to four nights a week, but there will be one night a week. I try to spend it with uh, with one of my kids or one of my grandkids. And then I really, really, really try hard not to um, to not to have something scheduled on Sunday evenings. I mean, we I have I have five children and grand and and uh, stepchildren and five grandchildren. And we try to have every other Sunday um, Sunday dinner at my house. So, and that's really important because they live right here in Middletown. Mm. You know, so in the on the off Sundays, I try to take a some time during that day and take one of them out and do an activity. Like I had my my oldest grandson with me yesterday. We did a tree planting. Oh. So where I do the environmental, you know, the energy environmental mental committee, there's a lot of things that you can do um, that sort of a, a, as a crossover, I, I enjoy it because that's really me. Like I am an environmentalist. I've been an environmentalist for a long time. So now the ability to take my grandson with me to do events like that. And now he says he wants to be an environmental scientist. So I'm very excited about that, but just teaching him environmental stewardship, trying to find a way to make sure that I'm able to bring my family into the work that's important to me as well, really kind of serves a double purpose there. But it, I find that to be incredibly helpful. Well, a little bit about me. So I spent over 25 years in the business world. And, um, and in the course of those 25 years, my husband and I were successful um, after infertility to have three children. But my oldest son was diagnosed 28 days after birth with a condition called periventricular leukomalacia. And oftentimes I kid around and say, now try and spell that. Um, and so that has left him severely disabled. And so, um, you know, I, I feel like my father taught me a very valuable lesson a lot of years ago. And um, he just kept reminding me that life isn't so bad and that we are of the fortunate folks to be able to bring home a baby. And so I keep that with me at all times. And it reminds me that um, that life isn't so bad and that I am fortunate. So I focus on that. I focus on uh, every day making sure that my children know that there's still so much more for us to do. There's so much for us to give back. And, um, and we just have to work hard at it. Again, we're coming back to giving myself grace of recognizing that balance off, often shifts to one side or the other. So I have not figured out how to make things level and equal. Um, there are times when I have worked entirely too hard and haven't taken care of myself and I'm exhausted. Um, and there are times where I'm like, forget that. I'm not doing that. I'm going to abandon everything responsible that I was supposed to do today. And I'm going to finish this really good book and sit up until three o'clock in the morning, even though I'm going to be tired in the morning. <laughs> um, and so I, I, you know, I still struggle with that. But I do think that what has been helpful for me 
is having a bunch of personal interests that I prioritize just as much as I prioritize my work. I think I'd work in, just like you, a, a really heavy field of things where a field where things get tough, emotional, discouraging. Um, and so I try to recognize when I'm feeling those things. And then I just put it down for a little while. And I, again, coming back to giving myself grace, I put it down for a little while. I give myself grace and I do what I need to do to take care of myself because I can't show up to save the world if I am not some version of okay. Yeah. Well, that's, again, that is a challenge that I am learning day to day to figure out how to balance everything. And I think, you know, as we've talked about, you can't be necessarily 100% on all of those really huge jobs and life roles every single day. Um, so, you know, I know that, you know, I'm about to have my second child in, um, you know, about two months. And so that's going to alter the balance of how my life looks like. Um, and so just trying to be honest with myself about that, be honest with, um, you know, colleagues, friends and family about what that all looks like and, and just sort of getting a little bit ahead of it. Um, but also just sort of knowing that, that I'm going to have limits. Um, and I'm going to need to make sure that my priorities are clear, not just to myself, but those around me um, so that, you know, we can can navigate that together. So I think when I feel the, the worst about balance is when I try to take everything on inside my own head and don't ask for help and don't express uh, my concerns about that balance is when it feels the heaviest and the least successful. So again, that's a learning process for me to learn how to sort of communicate, um, you know, those priorities and those, uh, I guess you could say weaknesses, but I think it's really just honesty about limitations that we all have at times. Um, so that's how I seek balance. Don't always succeed, but that's how I seek it. Now, as much as we try to balance everything, sometimes that ball gets dropped. How do you practice grace when you feel like you've, when you've dropped that ball or you feel like you've had a failure? Oh boy. So, you know, there are definitely times when um, I feel like I've dropped the ball or I just feel spread too thin. Um, like I've taken on too much. I think for a lot of us who want to kind of do and be a lot of things to a lot of people find ourselves in those moments. Um, you know, I think again, a, comes with a little bit of compartmentalization <laughs> is necessary. Um, and just to remember that, you know, trying sometimes comes with failure and not to beat oneself up about the fact that sometimes you're not gonna pull off everything flawlessly. Um, and while that can definitely cause a lot of pain, um, you know, it's okay. And you can keep moving forward um, and learn from those experiences and uh, just not beat yourself up about it. And it's easier said than done, but I think it's really important that if you do want to be, you know, out in the world doing things, even if you're just, you know, trying to focus on your day to day of being all that you can be for your family, you're not always going to be a hundred percent. And, uh, uh, but time does march on and there's opportunities to not just to learn, but to regroup and to try again. Uh, so I just try to keep that focus on, you know, where do we go from here? How do we make the most out of this going forward? And I think I, I benefit from being a fairly optimistic person. I think my fundamental outlook on life is that things are going to be OK, even if sometimes they don't feel um, OK. And uh, just to focus on that and keep pushing in that direction, even through those moments where you just you feel so surrounded by balls that you have dropped. Uh, those those days happen. Oh, that is a good question. How do I give myself grace when I feel like I dropped the ball? Um, I think first I acknowledge what I feel. Right. Like I think we beat ourselves up for beating ourselves up and. So we are always having these, well, not always, but I think we, we've gotten to a really interesting space in the last few years where we recognize that it is okay to not be okay, um, a good portion of us anyway, and we're having healthy conversations about it. Um, and so I've, I've tried to put myself in spaces with people that allow me to have those conversations, but also allow me to, to recognize that I do feel a way and that I'm not wrong for feeling a way um, and that it's okay to be disappointed in myself. 
it's okay to recognize that this may have been an opportunity for growth. And then I do reflection from there. If this was an opportunity for growth, what does that growth look like? How can I improve it the next time? If it's me just being too critical of myself, then I allow myself to rem I remind to remind myself of that, and I allow people to sew into me to remind me that I'm being too hard on myself. Just the same way that I do that for others when I see them being too hard on themselves, I, I allow myself to open up and say, okay, well maybe I'm just being a bit too tough, too cynical, too critical of myself. Um, and then I, I'm really um, big into like physical activity. So if I'm really having a rough time, I will go to the gym and lift really heavy weights. And you don't have time to be angry at yourself when you're lifting weights because you're going to drop the weight. So I'll lift really heavy weights or I will go for a walk and just try to clear my mind um, or I'll just read and just allow myself to kind of like come out of that space. Mm -hmm. um, because I think there really is something important to recognizing a, am I just being too critical of myself? Or B, is there an opportunity for growth? And in either one of those spaces, recognizing that you don't have to beat yourself up to to grow and you don't have to beat yourself up because we live in a society that tells us that we need to always be perfect. You know, I sometimes I don't. I mean, I'll be frank. Sometimes I, I, I don't give myself the grace um, that I might extend to others. Uh, I think sometimes we can all be our, our, our harshest critics, but I certainly try to remind myself that not everything is going to turn out exactly the way you hope or that you want, but that we can truly learn and grow from experiences that might not meet the expectation we have going in. And, and you'll never, you know, there, there have been experiences in my life where, you know, I've experienced what might, you, what you might call, what, what, what you would call a failure, right? Where something didn't work out, where you didn't get that job or you didn't, or you didn't produce what you hope to produce in the way you hope to produce it, whatever it may be, you know, I've certainly experienced my share of, of, of failures, but fundamentally at the end of the day, you never know what that failure opens up in other opportunities, right? Well, there are so many instances where had I actually succeeded in one area, I wouldn't have been able to get another experience in another area of life that actually was far more important and, and impactful, not just for me personally, but more broadly. Uh, and so I, I try to recognize that none of us, life has a way of intervening when you make plans. And none of us, none of us can truly know that this success in this spot and this area will lead to further success and this failure, for lack of a better term, in this area or in this spot will lead to only negative outcomes. Really life has a way of, of making lemonade out of lemons if you continue to persist and if you learn and you grow from those. And so I think just trying to give myself the grace to know that it's not the end of the road and there are positives that we can find in what might be a very difficult or seemingly negative moment. Oh, I'm always my toughest critic. Um, and so, and I always internalize, um, so, but I also express myself as well. So I lack probably the filter that I, I need the most. Um, but I feel like if I'm expressing myself, if I'm sharing how I feel, and oftentimes I will start the conversation by this is how I'm feeling. So, um, that way, uh, whoever I'm communicating with understands that it's not, um, anything personal, but it is about me and, and how I can relate to a particular situation. Um, but how do I, how do I move through that one communication? You have to be able to communicate. Um, so I work really hard on that, uh, because again, I internalize a lot of stuff, um, as probably most people do. Um, and our social media can be our toughest critics also outside of ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. We're open up, we're opened for uh, people to pick us apart very easily rather than empower us and say, wow, you know what? You had a great day today, or I'm so proud of the things that you've done. So oftentimes I'll use that as a form of encouragement for someone, um, but to relieve any stressors or to give myself a break, um, I like to exercise. It, it allows me to um, focus on me and give me 30 minutes of undivided 
attention to myself to be able to break down in my mind things that I could do better. That's hard because I'm really hard on myself like that. Um, That is probably one that I struggle with a lot. You know, I try to, what I try to say is in the grand scheme of things, is this really going to make a difference? And if you've done everything that you, you thought you could do and it just didn't work out or you missed something, just keep moving. Just keep moving. You know, there was nothing that was done with any malintent. You know, it was you missed the mark in some way. Just keep going. Every day it is a brand new day and you're going to have all kinds of opportunities to get on top of things um, in the future. And some days things break your way and some days they don't. And you don't have a lot of control over it a lot of times. Mm -hmm. Talking about mental health is still something that leaves many people feeling quite vulnerable. Um, It's not a subject that's easy for money to broach, and there's still a little bit of stigma behind it. Is it a topic that you find difficult to discuss, and have you had any experience um, dealing with mental health or mental illness? Oh, no matter. I'm always quick to bring up my experiences with depression and anxiety. Um, I experienced depression for the first time. well, actually, interestingly enough, I found a bunch of journals that I used to write in when I was younger, and I think I had experienced depression a lot sooner in life than I actually had the, the language to identify for myself. Mm-hmm. Um, the first time that I was able to identify it, I was 25 years old. Um, I was a foster parent to a teen mom and a two-year-old um, making $17 an hour with a master's degree and $100,000 worth of student loan debt living in a one-bedroom apartment. Wow. And there just came this moment where I was, where I realized like, this is too much. I'm not handling this well, but I don't know how to get out of it because I have these children that need me. <laughs> um, and so that was the first time I experienced depression. And I, I look back really frequently, tried to figure out how I cope with that. I don't think that I cope with it in healthy ways. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, I honestly don't think I did much coping more so than I did just pushing through. Um, but looking back at that, I can see that was kind of one of the first times that I experienced depression. But now what I would say is that there, I don't so much suffer from depression frequently anymore. There's still some seasonal depression because I'm, I'm a cancer. I'm a July baby. I love the sun. I need my vitamin D. So when the, you know, when the seasons change, I sometimes find that a little bit tough, but I think as I, as I went into my late, later twenties and, I'm still early 30s now. Um, Anxiety was more of this space that I have been kind of flip-flopping into now. And, you know, that comes from, I think, from myself being just this incredibly introverted and painfully shy person, even though most of the time people don't recognize that in me. I am painfully shy. I'm the person that sits in the back of the class and mumbles all of the right answers, but never raises my hand to share them um, and still get freaked out when I do that, right? And so... But being that person and then walking into this space that I am constantly in the limelight, constantly have to be the one to raise my hand and use my voice, constantly have to be debating, constantly the only um, openly queer Black woman in certain spaces. Um, That is a lot. And it's anxiety provoking sometimes. And I do it because it's necessary work. I do it because it's work that impacts other vulnerable communities. And so I'm happy to do it and I love to do it, but it doesn't take away the fact that sometimes it's very anxiety provoking. Sometimes it's nerve wracking. Um, And I think, again, that's why I lean so heavily into like physical activity or or mental stimulation with like reading and exercising, because it allows me to kind of have this time to reflect on what I'm feeling and then push that back out into the universe so that I don't let it reside inside of me. So I think a, a lot of the space where I have been in lately is figuring out like, what do I do to cope? Because I've been able to look back when I've experienced anxiety and depression in the past and realize that I didn't know coping at all. And what's really, really interesting to Madi about that is that I said I was 25. So I had already been through undergrad and graduate school as a social worker. So I knew how to cope. I knew what coping skills were, right? Right. Like, right the healthy things were that I told my clients to do on a regular basis and still like I couldn't put I couldn't do it for myself I didn't have anybody holding me accountable I didn't even let anybody know that I was struggling so how were people going to hold me accountable for taking care of myself and so it's really really interesting to recognize that even as mental health professionals 
we have our own stuff that we need to that we go through. We need to hold ourselves accountable and frig and have healthy coping skills. Um, but we experience these same things. We're not immune for them from them. And then, you know, there's a whole other added aspect of that when you add into the fact that we're black women experiencing these things, because then you have a racial element and a racist element in a racist world that puts an added burden of anxiety provoking experiences and depressive depression evoking um, experiences um, that we suffer from and that we are um, open to as Black women. Um, and so I'll stop there because I could go on a tangent about this. The answer to your question is I'm more than happy to talk about my mental health experiences because I think if it's going to help one person and if it's going to make one person recognize that they're not alone, that they're not the only ones experiencing this, then I'm more than happy to share my story, my story and experiences. Yes, absolutely. I have had to deal with it and it does make me feel a little bit vulnerable. Um, but I also think it's really, really important that we break the stigma. And one way to help break the stigma is to to share our own stories. And um, so those of us who have had mental health struggles, but you know, managed with the help of good therapy and, and good medication, to be able to overcome and and live with a mental health disorder, um, and and be successful in spite of a mental health disorder, I just think it's so important that we share our stories. I've had my own mental health struggles. Yes, it makes me feel vulnerable to share, but uh, I feel really strongly that I want the world to know. I want people who are struggling with it themselves to know that with good therapy and good pharmacological uh, interventions, if needed, for me they're needed. Um, you can absolutely live like an incredibly fulfilling, satisfying life and, and achieve things you never thought you'd achieve. I never thought I'd be elected to public office. And yet here I am. And I think I'm you know, pretty darn good at it. Um, and yet every day I deal with my mental health. Um, I, I have to have good mental health hygiene. I have to pace myself to make sure I don't get overwhelmed so I don't have another crisis. You know, I have to make sure I take care of myself so I can keep doing the good work I believe I can do in the community as a as an elected official. I, I'm I'm absolutely comfortable talking about it, but I, I will say I think it's it's taken time to get to a place where I feel comfortable talking about um, my own mental health, um, everything from anxiety to the experience of being trans and in the closet, um, and the the impact on my mental health that gender dysphoria had before I came out. Uh, and, and, you know, I think that that experience for me was exceptionally formative. I think one, it helped me get to a place where I, 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 I wanted to be perfect before I wanted to be, or at least what other people thought was perfect. I want to be the, I wanted to be on top of everything. I didn't want to have any, anything that I had to process. Mm -hmm. I feared that I, I thought if I had anything that I needed to process, I would be a burden on other people and, or a disappointment to other people. I felt like I had to have this sort of charade that I quote, had everything together. Um, but the process of coming out as trans sort of freed me of, of a lot of that, particularly as it relates to my mental health. Um, and I actually found strength and power in my journey to coming out in a way that allowed me to very deeply feel that allowing ourselves to be vulnerable is, 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 is not a flaw. It's not a weakness. It's very much a strength. And that when we allow ourselves to be vulnerable in front of others, it can have a life-saving impact for the folks who see that vulnerability, who finally get the, the message that it's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to have your own feelings and emotions. It's okay to think about your own mental health. And it's okay for that to be something that you have to think about. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and to take steps to, 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 um, to, to support and, and, and ensure positive outcomes in. And so I, I think for me, coming out as trans was was an incredibly transformative experience in my relationship with my own mental health, but also my feeling of just how important it is for us to allow ourselves to be vulnerable so that other people can feel that um, empowerment. The second thing I'd say is that, 
you know, in, in being the caregiver to my husband, Andy, during his, his battle with cancer, one thing I really saw was just how inextricably linked our physical and mental health are and how I saw that when Andy was, was able to be supportive and supported and loved when he was able to, to, um, have friends and family around him when he was in the, the, the best place possible with his, within his own mental health. And I say possible because of course there's always going to be a toll when you're struggling through cancer, um, that it had a meaningful different diff impact on his own strength, on his own physical health outcomes, on his own capacity to, to, to face the grueling treatment that, that he needed that was hopefully going to save his life. And, and I saw when his mental health was not at its, um, when he wasn't taking care of his mental health or when he wasn't able to take care of his mental health or when other things were impacting his mental health, how that impacted his physical health and his own capacity to, to, to get, to get better physically. And so for me, those two experiences really transformed my own understanding of the importance of mental health, my own relationship with mental health and my passion for, ensuring that every person can get the mental health care that they need because it is truly foundational care. It is truly foundational for all of us to not just be healthy, but truly for all of us to be able to thrive as our authentic selves. Yeah. I mean, I think I, I feel like it should be okay for us to talk about it. I feel more like uh, sometimes if I, I'll make a comment, I might hear something from someone maybe in my immediate family or friend group who might say like, don't say that if I sort of talk about going to a therapist or you're going to therapy. Um, I think it's great. I think we should be super open about uh, having those things just be part of our regular practice in life, just like going to any other doctor we would go to. Um, so I feel uh, pretty good about that. Um, I think that came with time and with learning, whether it was through friends of mine um, who were facing different behavioral health struggles and probably normalized that for me, um, or even my uh, my own daughter, I think, um, in sort of the language that she was learning in school and uh, just the world, I think, also has a very healthy attitude towards talking about mental health, which I think is really positive to see that in our younger generation. Um, very, very different, I have to be honest, from what I grew up hearing, where I think there was definitely more of a stigma and the idea of um, really not necessarily therapy, but 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 talking about things like uh, potentially needing to to have medication or other types of issues that they could be on a behavioral health spectrum as opposed to um, someone's individual failing. So I really feel feel very good about. Um, you know, my perspective on those types of things now for maybe what the world was saying, um, you know, in, in the 80s and 90s when I was a kid and growing up. So I'm always a firm believer that having a sounding board is significant in someone's life. And at a different points in our lives, we may need that. Um, sometimes people need it all every day, in order to get their day going and to be effective in their day. And some people just need it periodically. Do I think mental health is a taboo subject? I think that because you can't see the disability, it's easier to ignore. It's easier to say or to question that person's responses or their actions. Um, but I am thankful for an organization like NAMI. I'm thankful for the fact that we are opening the doors to have these conversations. Is it tough? It is. But you know what? No one's alone in this situation. Um, I think that there are things that, that, um, that really open the door to mental health, um, such as social media. There are different triggers in people's lives that do this. Uh, there's addiction. There are just, there are barriers that our kids are facing, right? Some of our kids, I use this uh, analogy all the time. They have these backpacks on their, on their backs. You can't see it, but it's so filled and it weighs them down. And yet we expect them to go into school. We expect them to, to participate in every single day. And yet you can't see it. And that's very similar to mental health, right? You can't see it. Um, so I am, I'm, I'm glad we're having these conversations. I am glad that we are no longer shying away from it. We know by doing that, it raises the rates of suicide. It raises the rates of isolation. Um, 
And so we need to do better. And how do you care for your mental health? What self-care tips do you practice? I do um, have therapists that I see periodically uh, for different things, whether it's, you know, individually or, you know, for, um, you know, like couples therapy, things like that. And uh, definitely encourage that among my family members as well. So um, I think it's good. I think it's great. I think the more that we talk about it, the more we normalize it. Um, the better off everyone will be and the better off we will all be able to be together. A combination of, you know, good therapy, you know, um, for, to help with my phobias and some of the triggers that I have and, and good medicine just, I mean, I, and I'm still, I'm still evolving. So there's a therapy that is very specific to help you get through um, phobias. So since driving was one of my biggest phobias, I did the therapy and it's amazing. Like the fact that I can drive to Dover on route one, you know, and I-95 and take the major highways. There was a time that I couldn't even imagine being able to do that, but I was so motivated. I was like, I am not going to let my phobias stand in the way. So I did this like very specific type of therapy that targets phobias and, um, and, and it worked. Well, sometimes I do it better than others. Um, you know, I, I would say I'm someone who very much is an introvert. And while I love being around people, while I enjoy company, the company of others, fundamentally, at the end of the day, I get my energy from being alone and sort of solitude. And, and so for me, there are a couple of things that I try to do just to sort of give myself some time and space to recharge, to, 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 have something to look forward to. Uh, that's always important for me is to always have something to look forward to, whether it's, you know, something in the weekend or an upcoming trip or something with my family to have, to always, to always have that. But I think fundamentally at the end of the day, if I'm ever feeling overwhelmed, one of the things that I just love to do is I'll get in my car, I'll take a drive, I'll get some coffee and I'll listen to music and I'll drive around the valley. Um, mm -hmm. And that's just, it's, it's meditative for me. Um, I've also started doing some art therapy through Lego architecture, which is just the right balance of focusing my mind without having to concentrate too hard on, on something that's really uh, intellectually intense. Is there any advice that you would give to girls or women out there for trying to succeed? Take time, even if it's only, you know, five minutes here or 10 minutes there to take a break in between um, projects to take a break throughout the day um, to kind of breathe, reassess, it's going to be okay. And then before you actually go to bed at night, put it away, you know, put it away. Don't do anything heavy before you try to go to bed because it'll be with you and you won't get good sleep at that, but put it away, try to relax and, and concentrate on just, bringing down your anxiety level and just calm before you go to bed. Something that, something that you enjoy, you know, something that brings you joy and peace before you go to bed. I, I really like mantras. Um, I read this book. I actually don't think I have it with me. I think it's downstairs. I read this book called um, Yoga Mind um, mm -hmm. a couple of years ago, and it was a really great book. Um, it's not actually about the physical practice of yoga more so than it is the philosophical practices of yoga. Um, and so it talks a lot about having a mantra. Um, and so I have a lot of little mantras that you'll hear me say, things like on my ancestors' wildest dreams. Um, but one of my ones that I really go back to is do it scared. Mm -hmm. Do it scared. Acknowledge that you're scared. And that is something that I always do for myself. I acknowledge that I'm scared. The little goosebumps that come on my arms or the tummy flutters or the headaches that come, don't let me forget that I'm scared, right? Like I'm never going to forget I'm scared. Yes, and do it anyway. I will do it anyway. Um, years ago, oh, I'm not going to remember the name. Years ago, Will Smith and Jaden Smith did a movie trying to see if I can find it while I'm talking to you. Um, and the movie flopped. It wasn't a great movie, actually. In, um, Was it that one where they came to Earth or something? Yes, After Earth. Um, it wasn't a great movie, and Will Smith talked about it in his book, how like Jaden was crushed after. But I thought it was the greatest movie. It just didn't do well in the theaters. But yeah. I it was a great movie. But one of the lines that I remember from that movie is Will telling, telling Jaden that fear is not real. Mm. Fear 
does not exist. Fear cannot be touched or or felt, right? So, but what is real is danger, right? Mm -hmm. And so it is it is perfectly acknowledgeable. It is perfectly worth acknowledging that situations can be dangerous, whether it's dangerous to our physical, whether it's dangerous to our mental. Um, and those are situations that sometimes you need to reevaluate. But fear is something that we cultivate inside ourselves. And so it cannot harm us. Fear cannot harm us. Fear can tell us how to operate in a situation. Fear can tell us how to move in a situation, but fear cannot harm us. And so if fear is the only thing that I'm feeling, that's okay. Because I do think I can do things when I'm feeling things. I can do things when I'm feeling happy. I can do things when I'm feeling tired. I can do things when I'm feeling sad. Why can't I do things when I'm feeling scared? True. So that that is what I tell myself and that's how I get through it. And it doesn't take away the fact that, you know, even all these years later doing this work, um, well, not all these years, it's been two years, but like <laughs> this time later doing this work, the fear and the anxiety doesn't go away. Um, I'm just now able to control it a little better. I'm able to mold it and operate it through it a little better. In the Mate, please don't think that there weren't times when I first started doing this that I wasn't on a stage stuttering sometimes, that I didn't forget my my rehearsed lines that I was going to say. Like, those things happened. <laughs> like, those things yeah. totally happened. There are times when I just completely flopped. And that's okay. It happens because we're human. We're created to be imperfect beings. And I think acknowledging that and recognizing that. And one other thing that helped too is recognizing that for other women, that when it happens for other women and uplifting them, mm. right? Because that reminds me that just like me, they are humans. I am human just like they are. I am imperfect just like they are. We all have those flops. And if I can uplift another person and I can see them smile after their flop, I can do the same for myself after my own because we're mm -hmm. human and we have those experiences. And sometimes I think those are even beneficial for us because it reminds us we still have a little ways to go. We still have work to do. And that is okay because we're never going to be perfect creatures. We're just always in pursuit of perfection. Know that you're not alone. People have these disorders. They're real. Um, it's a brain imbalance. It's a chemical imbalance. It's no different from being a diabetic who has an imbalance. You know, it's any... We cannot, we have to stop separating mental health from, from physical health as if they're two different things. A chemical imbalance is no different than any other type of, uh, you know, physiological imbalance that causes all kinds of other problems that we are much more comfortable talking about. For some reason, when it's a mental health or brain chemistry issue, you know, we, we treat it differently. It, and, and then we stigmatize people and we and people stigmatize themselves because they think, what's wrong with me? I'm crazy. We have that. I'm crazy. You're not yeah. crazy. And and there's help out there and you can completely overcome it. Um, I've overcome it. It doesn't mean I don't live with it daily, but I know how to handle it. And I know what to do when I have a flare up. And and you can, too. I just want people to know you can be a state senator. You can be a U.S. senator. You can be freaking president of the United States. You can do anything with a mental health disorder. It doesn't have to hold you back. Thank you again so much for joining me and for sharing your insight. Again, my name is Nimadi. I'm with NAMI Delaware, and I hope you all have a great day. Mm -hmm.